H.P. Lovecraft created my favorite kind of horror. Existential dread, fear of that which you cannot comprehend. Monsters that defy the very reality they invade. Sadly, the likes of Cthulhu and Nyarlathotep don't actually exist, I think. So the best I have to offer you are the horrors of our own world. From unpredictable and terrifying people to supernatural entities that you pray don't lurk around you. These are five allegedly true and disturbing stories even Cthulhu gets scared of. If you have a creepy experience, share it with us at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. Man in the Trees from Joanne my cousin Rebecca and I would always be out each weekend when we were about 11. We'd be making dins, riding our bikes through the woods and whatnot. It wasn't far from where my house was, but we picked up the courage to go to a certain wooded area, one that we'd heard many creepy stories about. There was a fence around the perimeter of these woods. If that wasn't a warning sign, I don't know what is. There were a few broken gaps along the fence line that we used to sneak in. We were both quite creeped out of the place. Some of the stories from these woods are enough to send shivers up your spine, especially when you're just 11. I've heard a story about a goat being tied to a wooden post in the middle of the woods, and if you went near it, a man would come running out and chase you. There are other stories about an unknown man inhabiting these woods, but no one knew what he was or what he wanted. We walked far into the woods, our breathing becoming heavy, and every twig we stepped on seemed ten times as loud as it should have been, causing us to jump. And we soon saw something that made us scream and run together out of those woods and never come back. After hearing some strange noises in the canopy above, our curious child minds forced us to look up, and we were met with the source of the noise. Sitting amongst the trees, resting upon one of the many branches, was what appeared to be a large and hairy man. And I mean he was covered in hair, even on his face. Before I could tell if he was wearing any clothes or not, the two of us were running away from him, panicked, trembling. We basically fell through the broken fence and across the fields all the way home. We told my mother what we saw. She was understandably shocked. She really didn't know what to say other than, don't ever go back in those woods again. But she didn't need to tell us, because I had no plans on returning there. To this day, I remember this clearly. And I wonder if the younger generations that have dared to go into those woods have a similar story. What did we see back then? Was it some man with a rare hair growth disorder who happened to enjoy climbing trees in the middle of the woods? Or was it something else entirely? Mother's Possession From Mr. Southerner Growing up, my family has had a number of paranormal experiences. I was young back then and didn't really understand what was going on or why. There were always things turning on by themselves. Things would constantly be thrown. Glasses and dishes would somehow be all over the house in random spots. When I was 11, I saw something awful. My mother, out of nowhere, fell to the ground, shaking violently in front of me. Now that I'm older, I believe what I witnessed was my mother possibly overdosing. I think she was on something, which is why I believe her habit opened a gateway of paranormal activity into our home and lives. When I was 12, I had had enough of this and decided to move out of my mother's house, and I began to live with my grandparents. I have three older brothers who stuck it out after I moved out. 
I then only lived half a mile away from my mother's house, so it wasn't really that far. But my brothers would always call and tell me about the creepy things that happened during the day and how strange mom would be acting. Fast forward a year later, I decided I would stay at my mother's house as two of my brothers were staying at a friend's house for the weekend. That would leave my youngest brother, who was only eight at the time, and I didn't want to leave him by himself there. I asked a friend of mine to come over for the night. He happily did, and we planned to play some video games all night. But that night would instead be forever seared into my mind for other reasons. Me and my friend and my brother were playing video games. My mom was in the bathroom cleaning. That's when all hell broke loose. All of a sudden, the door slams shut and my mom starts screaming. As I threw my controller down and ran to the door, I could hear my mother screaming in there, Leave me alone, she was saying. No matter how hard I tried to open the door, it wouldn't budge. After a lot of effort, I managed to kick the door open. What I saw inside was my mother in the tub with the shower curtain wrapped around her. As I grabbed her to pull her up, something was forcing her back down, something that I could not see. So to me, it didn't make any sense. With all my might and that of my friends as well, we managed to get her out of the tub. As we got the shower curtain unwrapped from her body, her arm had blood running down it. As we cleaned the blood from her arm, we found these scratch marks running from the top of her arm down to her elbow. We got my mother cleaned up and she laid down for the night. About an hour after that, me, my friend, and my brother were watching TV in the living room. From there, we were able to keep an eye on my mother's bedroom at one point in the night, my youngest brother decided to check on her, and as he went to her bedroom and turned on the light, he immediately ran out of the room, screaming, Mom's freaking out! I rushed into my mother's bedroom. I found her spinning around like she was dancing or something. I tried to forcibly sit her back on her bed, but as I do that, she begins trying to bite me and claw at me. I eventually got her set down, and as I do, I noticed her body shaking. Then she simply snapped out of whatever was going on with her. I went to get her a glass of water, and when I returned, I noticed my mother just sitting there with her head looking at the floor. Mom, are you okay? She didn't respond. I asked again, Mom! At that moment, she replied to me. Her response was the thing that is seared into my head. I remember her vividly. She looked up at me very slowly, turning her head, and in a deep and very disturbing voice that did not seem to be her own, I heard her speak the words to me. She'll never be yours. I called my grandparents to come and get my brother and to send my friend home. And despite my fear, I stayed through the night, fighting to stay awake and to make sure my mother didn't get hurt. A few days later, my grandparents called their pastor to come say a blessing over the house. After that, the strange and unexplained activity throughout the house seemed to stop. And since that day, I don't watch movies pertaining to demonic possessions, as I don't want to experience anything like that ever again. It's quite traumatizing for a young teenager. Priest House From Frederick I'm from Finland. When I was younger, I was living with my family in a priest house. My mother was a priest. Living together, it was me, my mother, father, and two brothers, and sometimes my grandma would come visit us. Now, for the span of seven years, 
This house was a living paranormal nightmare. It was a very old house, about 200 years or so, I think. In the beginning, when we moved into it, it was almost like any other normal priest house. But all in a single day, the paranormal nightmare began. The first happening was when my brother was home, and an old china plate was taken down from the wall. My brother was alone with one friend that day, and asked his friend, we shouldn't play with our old antiques. But my brother's friend insisted that he hadn't touched the plate. My brother trusted this friend, and thought that this was strange. After that, all was normal for a few months. Our family woke up many nights, though, after that, hearing something or someone heavily walking around the stairs from the second floor that always stopped at the second door on the first floor. At this point, we all knew there was something strange going on in that house. These creepy phenomena only got worse the longer we lived there, as if something was getting further and further annoyed with our presence. One night, when I was walking to the toilet, I noticed our table and chairs were placed on each other like a pyramid, a scene similar to the one found in the Poltergeist film. When I told my parents about this, they saw it too and went pale. They seemed just as scared and confused as I was. My father got angry for a moment after that, demanding that the rest of the family stay behind him. As he commanded whatever spirits there to get out of his house, he then checked every floor and room, just in case there was some intruder or crazy person messing with us, but there was no trace of anyone else except us. After these events, things worsened. Days after that, I was again walking to the toilet during the night. This time, I walked right into something sticking out of the wood floor, something that wasn't there before. Turning on the light, I couldn't breathe, because what I saw on the floor was a samurai sword that we had for decoration. It was stuck extremely deep through the wooden floor. It was so deep. It was deeper than my dad could get it, which he tested for himself. This disturbed me highly. This exact event happened twice altogether. And after the second time, my father took the sword himself, and he kept it near his bedside, with one eye open for safety. And by that point, we were all sleeping in the same room together, terrified. One night, we woke up, listening to those footsteps again, walking from the second floor, down the stairs, to the room where we all were in. The footsteps stopped right beside my parents' bed. Something tried to grab hold of the sword, which my dad was grasping with both hands. My dad is over 100 kilograms, but this thing nearly yanked him out of the bed like some rag doll. We were all shocked at this point, I remember thinking just how strong this poltergeist must have been, and now each of us had witnessed it directly. All of a sudden, my dad was left alone, and after a silent second or two, something began to remove books from the bookshelf, throwing one of them straight at my dad's head. This house was attacking us. Honestly, horror movies after this did not do the haunting thing justice, some of them seemed more like comedies after experiencing crap like this yourself. As the months went by, there would be several months with just strange noises around the house that took us a while to get used to. Other months, nothing at all would happen, leaving us hopeful that it was over. During our time at that house, we got a dog, and almost immediately after, it began acting up again. One time, our dog got really angry and began to show his teeth at something that we could not see. He was looking at something at the corner of the ceiling. We named that dog Caxon. Other times, Caxon would be very scared of something, even though we could not place it. Caxon was a smart and fast dog, but he never went alone upstairs to the second floor, no matter what we tried to do. The top of the stairs at the second floor 
That seemed to be where everything originated and got worse. One time, my two younger brothers ran for their lives downstairs, crying, saying something moved around with them, started grabbing objects around them and moving them and tossing them about. One time when the poltergeist seemed especially angry at Christmas, my dad saw something coming down the stairs. Immediately, my dad grabbed a knife, though I'm not sure what he thought that was going to do to a spirit. But I did catch a glimpse of what he saw. It was a very dark shadow, floating down and up the stairs. It didn't stop until my dad ran up the stairs chasing it with that knife. After that, we heard some screaming from upstairs, as my dad tried and failed to scare it out of the house. When he came back downstairs, he was pale. We asked him what he saw exactly. He told us he had never seen anything so disgustingly evil and vile. He claimed he saw the entity up close and in more detail. It was definitely masculine. He even got close enough to try to stab it, but the moment he passed through its form, he heard this evil-sounding laugh as the dark shadow faded into nothingness. This spirit ruined everything for us. One Christmas even, when my grandma was over, she was so scared by the spirit that after an hour or so of being there, she took an 80-kilometer ride home via taxi just to get away. Our dog seems to have some PTSD from that house as well. He didn't always act so nervous and cautious, but even after moving, he's always like this. Poor baby. We moved away from that house many years ago, and thankfully, my family has stopped having any sort of paranormal experience. Nowadays, the priest house is empty. Whenever people do move in, they move out even faster. This was my story, my experiences that taught me that the paranormal was real, and that oftentimes it should be something that is feared. What was this entity? From Shy Silver 23. I've been going to the same church for nine years and have always felt safe inside. However, there has always been this one part of the church that has what I can only describe as an oppressive aura about it. It was on a Wednesday night around 5.30 it was already dark out, as it was in the early days of December. I brought two of my friends along with me, A and S. We were going to the youth group together at that church that night. I was telling them about this one area of the church that made me feel incredibly uncomfortable, and they immediately took interest. So we decided to go check it out. I didn't exactly like the idea, and tried to talk them into not going through with it. But A and S were hyped, and there was nothing I could do to change their minds. After all, S was dead set on trying to communicate with some sort of spirit. In fact, she was the type of person that carried some things in her purse at all times, such as smudge sticks, pendulums, and dishes for ashes, which she had me get out of her bag before we went to explore. She told me first we'd go and check out the area, which was in the very back of the church on the second floor. Fast forward a bit. I brought A and S to the area in question. This place consists of a small hallway with two rooms on one wall and two more rooms on the other wall around the corner. This then goes to two bathrooms and a flight of stairs. So we go into the first room, which ironically is my youth pastor's office, and sat in the dark, not saying a word to one another. S puts her elbow on the desk, holding a pendulum still, and then she asks, Is there a spirit here with us? After waiting a few seconds in the dark and quiet, the pendulum began to swing clockwise on its own. My breath was taken away from me. S smiled and whispered, telling us that that meant yes, as soon as it started to swing, 
I had a feeling come over me like a slight wind. Goosebumps formed on my arms, and I felt a slight feeling of anger. A must have felt something too, because she then looked over at me and asked, Are you angry too? The pendulum then began to swing violently clockwise, causing S to drop it in a panic. As soon as it hit the floor, we began to hear rattling and violent pounding coming from the closet, which also happened to have a ladder up to the roof inside. The doors then swung open to reveal nothing but an empty closet. The amount of anger I felt coming from the closet made me book it out of there, my friends following suit. After we came to our senses and calmed our nerves, we decided to go check out the stairwell, which went down to the basement door. We debated whether to go into the three other rooms, but eventually decided to vote against it. So we get to the stairs and enter the stairwell. The first thing we noticed was the temperature difference in the stairwell versus the hallway. It was incredibly cold here. We began to descend the stairwell, and we stood at the bottom with the pendulum in S's hand. And like the dumb teenagers we were, we decided that asking more questions was a good idea. We asked once again, is there someone there? The pendulum swung once more, signaling yes. We asked, are you angry? We held our breaths in anticipation, and the pendulum swung again, another yes. Are you going to hurt us? We asked. Yet again, a yes. That's when the lights flickered, went out for a moment, only to come back on. I fell back towards the wall, felt as if I was pinned there. I couldn't breathe. It felt as if there was a heavy weight on my chest, one that only increased with every passing second. I looked at A and S, and they looked terrified too. They were frozen like I was. Suddenly, I felt lightheaded and as if I was going to pass out. S was panting as the pressure on our chests began to increase more. <laughs> we need to go, now. A stammered. Once she said this, the pressure decreased enough to where we could move. We then hightailed it up the stairs and out of that corner. When we got back to the room we first were in before we went to investigate, no one was there. Everybody was already in the youth room waiting for the lesson to start. We decided we would not be going back into that area of the church, not even with a smudge stick. Ever since then, I have not gone back to that hallway, and I never will, because there's something there that's extremely mad and it doesn't want any visitors. A Normal Day from Yomi I live in Illinois, and I've been living there all my life. I've never seen anything weird, just bumps in the night and creepy shadows on occasion, things that can be easily explained away. But... Nothing compares to what I saw October 10th of 2019. It was a cold, windy day, and I had just gotten done with all my work. I was ready to relax for the night. I got up from my office desk and went downstairs to my basement to see what was on TV. Nothing special, just some cartoons, college basketball, and other sporty channels. That wasn't exactly to my tastes at the moment, so I decided to get some fresh air instead. I ran upstairs and grabbed my light jacket, slipping on a pair of my jogging shoes that my mom had just bought me the prior day. I opened up the back door to my house and began my path towards the park. The library isn't far away, but it has some large areas between it, such as a small tunnel where a train can go over and an arch going over a central road street where people can walk over. But I was taking the path where the small tunnel was. I've never been scared of the tunnel since it was around 30 feet wide, but I've been scared of rats or homeless people jumping me there, so I took my time going in. Now, I'd usually walk over the bumpy road through a patch of grass on the sidewalk, then chat with a few people walking their dogs as they walked by. 
But that day, everything was quiet. No birds chirping and nobody out. That was odd enough. I got over to the bridge and I could hear the drops of waters from the ceiling, along with the splashing of wild mice jumping here and there. Before I went in, I checked for other people and turned my head, looking both left and right. Then I scanned the tunnel for any shapes I might recognize, like a person or especially large rats. I gasped when I thought I saw a pair of legs standing there. I looked up and saw a torso, but I did not see a head. There was a person inside the tunnel, that much I was sure of. They were really tall and had a dirty outfit that looked like it hadn't been washed for 20 years. I didn't want to take a chance of getting jumped, so I turned around and walked back home. Later that week, around October 14th, I was curious on how high the bridge is, seeing that the person that I saw there was awfully tall. As I said before, I could not see his head, so he was taller than the entrance of the tunnel. I was horrified to discover that the tunnel itself was 12 feet tall. Maybe I saw the world's tallest man, or maybe it was something else. Maybe avoiding that tunnel from now on is my best option. All H.P. Lovecraft would be proud of you, enduring these stories of the unknown and the terrifying, all while maintaining your sanity. Oh, you're already crazy. That's what I thought. But don't worry. Your secret is safe with me, you psycho. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you have a scary story of your own, and you want to have a chance to have it narrated, share it with us at darkstories.org. If you want to support the show, check the links below. There's a link to my Patreon, and a link to my merch store. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode, about three scary stories from 4chan. Crimson Carson says, you should do scary Christmas stories. Heck yeah, and if you guys have any scary Christmas stories, be sure to send it to me at darkstories.org so I can narrate it. Maybe that should be my next video. We'll see, I'm pretty bad with timing, so I'm not making any promises just yet. Jimin290 says, I hope something here will actually scare me. If you want to be scared, just go to bed and remember all the times you were awkward. All those high fives that were actually handshakes that you missed. Ugh, I'm getting chills right now. Sir Bindi says, This world is a strange one. Anyone remember that? No need to remember, because I still say it, and I don't know why people think I don't. And a lot of people have been asking me to use the old music I used to use. Well, I kinda can't at the moment. Turns out if for any reason I can never afford to renew my subscription with the place that owns that music, I lose the license retroactively, so I can technically still use it. But if I ever lose that license because I can't afford it, then all the hundreds of videos I've used that song in will be gone, and I'd rather avoid that. Colin Mellon says, Today is my birthday, and you uploading is the best present. Thank you. Well, I hope you made it a really good and happy birthday for yourself. Everyone young and old should always celebrate a birthday. Being an adult with no money is no excuse. Get out there and have a good time. And WV Big Cat says, Hello from West Virginia. Making fudge and getting scared. Fudge is delicious. I happen to make it after getting scared, if you know what I mean. Gross. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. But don't you worry, because more scary stories are on the way soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. They are some amazing supporters. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.